All right, oh, so I have to do this. Um, I do travel around the world, and I tell my family that I am uh, that I'm world famous. It's in a very, very narrow, <laughs> narrow slice of the world. I'm sorry. I've taken to bring back pictures. I really went to talk to people. What? I never even listened to you, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the first time I had the pleasure of addressing the philosophy plenary session was as chair of the 2007 conference uh, back in my hometown of Victoria. And, and since then, I've been fortunate enough to be allowed to keynote um, in Sydney, here-ish, uh, Denver, Nottingham, Seoul, and Boston. So this is actually the sixth time um, I've been allowed to stand in front of a philosophy plenary to speak. And, and by accident, if not designed, I seem to be on a biennial, biennial rotation. Um, and I also seem to be stuck in a rut. Uh, after my turn as conference chair, I talked in 09, 11, 15, 17 about um, open source economics and, and then open source economics and then open source economics and also open source economics. And finishing up with open source economics. And today will be no exception. <laughs> um, but I have my reasons because uh, open source is a social system. And, and when you're embedded in a system, it's good to know how that system works. And, and I think it's worthwhile to talk about systems because so many of the tales we tell ourselves about open source are rooted in, in cultural myths about individual achievements and choices, and they ignore the systems that the individuals are working within. Um, and to understand what's going on, you need an appreciation of both, you know, both the systems and the stories. So let me put this in terms I think we can all understand. Um, <laughs> The story of Star Wars is structured around a handful of heroes and villains and their success or failure. And the story is determined by their own individual actions. Yeah? Uh, it's, it's the whole Joseph Campbell journey of the hero structure. Um, and it's about, you know, private imagination. It's not about systemic structures, but individual actions. And yet, and yet the Star Wars series as a whole has a systemic structural subject, um, which is that no matter how many times the individuals triumph, the system just keeps coming back. <laughs> you know, blow up the Death Star, the system just builds a new Death Star. Blow up that Death Star and kill the Emperor to be safe, and the system just raises up a new absolute ruler and builds an even bigger Death Star. Um, Star Wars teaches us that in the long run, systemic changes are far more powerful than heroic individual actions. And also, there's always a bigger Death Star. <laughs> so so we, have to, we have to support systems that, that generate the results that we're looking for. Um, but anyways, I, I, chose, I chose Why We Code as the title for this talk by way of reference to Why We Fight, which was a series of World War II films uh, produced by the US government, directed by Frank Capra. Uh, and obviously, they're created in the context of a mass war mobilization, so the film were propaganda. Um, but Why We Fight was an odd piece of propaganda. Like, first of all, it was seven hour long films. <laughs> Imagine that, you know, in the area of 15 second Attention span, seven hour long films. <laughs> um, second, the film spent a lot of time on background, the history, the geography, the context, and how these informed the goal. And a great deal of effort was spent to build up a rational argument. So, in a far simpler approach, would have just been the emotional 15 second ad. Uh, so, why we fight was propaganda, but it was nuanced propaganda, um, which is why I chose why we code for today. Because there's a 15 second soundbite answer to that question. Um, and then there's what I'm going to subject you to today. <laughs> so I have some nuance to talk about you today. Um, nuance because too many of our discussions of open source and other alternatives are simplified down to black and white. Um, because too often we ignore the economic and cultural context that open source is embedded in. So why we code? Now, there's lots of easy answers, which are variations of pure propaganda. They're the, they're the mythic answers. They're the emotional ones. Um, they're easy to visualize. Um, freedom! Freedom's a favorite. Uh, software free to read, free to modify, free to risk redistribute, and, uh, and we code free software for idealism. Um, for the glory of it is another. You know, we code and release open source for ego gratification, you know, to generate admiration in our peers. Um, scratch an itch, that's another popular reason. We code for, for localized, practical reasons. We code problem solve. But, but all these easy answers depend on an unspoken assumption. They make a big guess about who we, who we is. Um, who is this we 
doing all the coding, right? When we talk about why we code. So, so the low ranger taught them that they're riding across the plains. Um, when over the hills in front of them, there comes a war party of bloodthirsty Sioux warriors. This looks like trouble, Tom. No. We better run, says the Lone Ranger, and they double back, fleeing the Sioux. And they haven't been riding five minutes when they crest the hill and see coming up towards them a whole army of Cree soldiers and wearing death masks and armed with muskets. Ride hard, Tom. That was our last chance, the Lone Ranger cried. They turn left and they ride hard down the slope and they turn and gallop through small tops of trees. And coming out, they run headlong to a party of Lakota who can bear down on them, their attention's clear. And as a circle of native warriors closes in on them, the Lone Ranger turns to Tonto and says, well, Tonto, it looks like we're done for. To which Tonto replies, what do you mean we, my man? <laughs> <laughs> Tonto's right. Now, we is a very contextual word. And, and we inhabit a lot of we's simultaneously, even within narrow fields like working with computers and writing software. Um, who are we, anyways, when we code? And, and the mythic simple answer, the easy propaganda answer, is, is the low hacker, right? We answer why we code by digging up a crude cultural caricature. And so, and so the canonical open source creator is Linus Torvalds, writing the operating system in his bedroom as an undergraduate student in Finland, or, or it's Guido Van Rossum building Python as a Christmas project to, to keep himself occupied. <laughs> because what else would you go for business? Mort <laughs> uh, Richard Stallman building GNU Emacs in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, creating the first brick of the GNU free software edifice. But, but, but the easy mythic answer is wrong or, or very incomplete. You know, at best, it starts right and then tends over time toward gross wrongness. Um, you know, Linus started the Linux kernel alone in his bedroom 26 years ago, that's true. Um, but today, Linux is maintained mostly by corporations. <coughs> Intel, Red Hat, Lenaro, Samsung, SUSE, IBM. They account for a third of kernel development. Um, so rather than talk about brand heroes, I'm going to talk about generic agents um, who each play a role in the interlocking economies of open source. Um, the agents are the software itself, individuals who use the software and who create the software, and finally, institutions, corporations, governments, NGOs, universities, and so on, who use the software and create the software. And all these agents interact, but within different economies. Different pieces of software compete within an attention economy. Different participants in the open source software community exchange value within a gift economy. And of course, individuals and institutions interact within our all-consuming cash economy. So let's start, let's start with the software itself uh, and the attention economy that it lives in. The, the idea behind the attention economy is that in a, in a post-scarcity world, in a world, in a world where, where people's basic needs are already met, people will not compete for physical resources or wealth. What they'll compete for is attention. But we already have a basic human attention economy in place. Uh, and we have a name for the people who are attention rich. Uh, they are called celebrities. Um, and as in the cash economy, the rich often get richer as attention gets more attention. And attention is surprisingly fungible. Um, attention earned in one field can often be converted into attention in another. Um, however, a true attention economy requires a post-scarcity world um, where our day-to-day -day physical needs are met by fall. And yet we don't live in a post-scarcity world. So we humans, we, can have, we have this hybrid cash and attention economy that can lead to some odd scenarios um, where our cash economy and attention economy confer very different amounts of wealth on the same person. So for example, the case of a YouTube celebrity who amassed millions of followers but had to shoo away her fans so she could actually do her waitressing job, which paid her rent. She was attention rich but cash poor. Now keep the attention economy in mind, but replace humans with software. Uh, open source software lives in a software attention economy in which software trades utility with humans in exchange for attention. Now, open source software has very few needs. Right? Uh, it doesn't need food or sleep or clothing. Uh, it can reproduce perfectly at zero cost via copying. It's almost immortal. Uh, the only thing software needs to stay alive is at least one person that cares about it. Uh, a little bit of attention. Because operating systems change, new formats are developed, small bugs are found. Unmaintained software will die. 
you know, the original Emacs text editor, it ran on a PDP-10 minicomputer. That code is dead. Richard Stallman's GNU Emacs, which has been maintained continuously since 1984, will run on your Android phone, if you want. So in this software attention economy, open source software competes for attention. And the software that accrues more attention develops faster, gets better documentation, it gets a snazzier website, and these things in turn allow the software to gain yet more attention. Just like the dollar economy, in the software attention economy, the rich get richer, and everyone else gets squeezed. You know, money begets money, Attention begets attention. So there's a reason that smart open source projects spend a lot of time on the documentation, you know, on their quick start copy, on their one click downloads, to grow the pool of people around the software. Now the overall pool of users, they're going to include you know, some percentage of power users and documenters and evangelists, and that sub pool will include some percentage of bug reporters and fixers, and that sub pool will include some percentage of core developers and maintainers. And job one for any project in the attention economy is attracting more attention. So, who can provide attention to hungry software? <laughs> individuals. Institutions can too, but only through the mechanism of individuals. Intel does not write Linux patches. People on the Intel payroll write Linux patches. So, just like Soil and Creed, open source is people. <laughs> open source is people. Um, so let's start with the people who use software, the individual software consumers. Um, on the one hand, individual consumers aren't very interesting to the discussion of free software because they don't contribute to free software directly. They don't really care about software freedom as a concept. They participate in the cash economy. They might occasionally contribute a proprietary software program with some money now and again. But software freedom, per se, is, is irrelevant to them. Um, that might sound a bit dis dismissive. But you can infer how much individuals care about software freedom from the market performance of user-facing free software. Um, in, the, in the office automation world, the rise of an acceptable open source alternative to Microsoft Office barely dominated, barely dead to the dominant dominance of Office. Um, open Office and Libre Office, they've been around for a long time. But Office remained supreme, reigned supreme uh, until the coming of the cloud. Uh, it was, in the end, it was the extra convenience of uh, Google Docs for sharing and collaboration, along with the zero dollar price point that finally threatened the dominance of Office in a meaningful way. And in the browser world, back in the early aughts, it looked like Firefox proved that open is better, you know, uh, as it rose and it took over from the Internet Explorer. But what well, turned out, actually, you know, better is better. <laughs> Users moved to Firefox because it was better than IE, not because it was open. And now you just have freely migrated back away from Firefox to Chrome and Safari, even back to IE as each took a turn as the best performing, cleanest alternative on various platforms, desktop and mobile. Individual consumers just don't care very much about software freedom. And in fairness, you know, to exercise software freedom, it generally helps understand how to write and build software. And most individual consumers just don't have those skills. Now, that doesn't mean software freedom has no constituency among people who cannot write or modify software themselves. It just means that their, their experience of software freedom is very indirect. Um, but if individual consumers did care, it would dramatically alter our relationship with digital technology. And this is probably why Richard Stallman is still willing to talk to people about software freedom after all these years. If all people cared about it just a little, um, we would all be a lot more free. But take a look at the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. <coughs> so the people most directly served by the First Amendment are those who publish criticism of the government, or assemble, or protest the government, or sue the government for misconduct. And now while I understand those categories of people have grown a great deal in the last couple of years, <laughs> they do not include all the people. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of people who have no words to publish, people who do not wish or have time to assemble, people who have no case to litigate. And yet, and, and yet I wager even those who find nothing to criticize or protest or litigate would be loath to see the First Amendment revealed. They don't directly exercise the freedoms of the First Amendment, but they do appreciate the freedom it provides them at a remove. 
Now imagine if every individual consumer valued software freedom as much as they value freedom of speech. Now how would our conversation about technology and privacy and control of our personal data be different than? However, um, for the moment, they don't care. Uh, when individual consumers use open source for reasons don't have anything to do with software freedom, they use it because it doesn't cost money, or because it works better than the alternatives for their purposes, or because their nerdy needs installed it for them. So let's, let's move on past the individual users to the individual open source software makers. Um, we've already covered the mythic makers, you know, the hacker and the basement archetypes. Uh, there's a place for the mythic framework, but we have to be really careful about applying it because it's too easy to cover over complex truths with simple patterns. Like some projects do start with a simple contributor and add on extra contributors over time, but a surprising number don't. Even ones who might think have a clear providence. People sometimes introduce me as the founder of Postgres, and I am a person who has a long prominent association with Postgres projects. But way back in 2001, when I said, hey, it would be great to have a spatial data type in Postgres, it was Dave Blasby who said, yes, and I know just how to do that, and actually wrote the code. Um, it wasn't me. Now, at the time, Dave worked with my consulting company, Refractions, other people at the company, Chris and Jeff wrote some early code too. So who founded Postgres? There's not a singular answer. Um, so I usually say, no, no, introduce me as a co-founder. But there's even more to the story than that, which I'll get to later. So let's put the mythic individuals aside for a moment, because non-mythic individuals are the real story. Uh, they have a problem to solve. They find the open source software that can solve it. They use it. It works. They ask a question about the software. They get an answer. They see a question. They provide an answer. They're asked if they use the software. They provide a reference. They find a shortcoming. They find a way to apply effort to getting a fix added. They add a new feature. They find a way to apply effort to getting that feature added. Now note that there is a, there is a continuum of involvement here. You know, at the start, the software and the project are adding value to the individual. And at the end, the individual is adding value to the software. At the start, the individual acts alone. At the end, the individual is working as part of a community, community of interest around the software. Once a project has sufficient attention to grow, once there is a community of interest of users and developers, another economy comes into being within that community, a gift economy. A gift economy is one in which valuables are not traded or sold, but are given without an explicit agreement for immediate or future rewards. The classic example of a gift economy is the potlatch tradition of uh, the First Nations of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, before European colonization in the 1800s, a powerful chief would demonstrate his power and mass influence, not by hoarding more and more wealth, but by holding a huge feast, a potlatch, and distributing all his wealth to other families in his tribe and to neighboring chieftains. The Western capitalistic folks find it hard to understand the rationale behind a gifting culture to the extent that the ceremony was actually banned in Canada from 1885 until 1951. This picture is from a modern day ceremony in the 80s. In open source communities, the most influential people are almost always the most frequent and consistent contributors and the ones who give up their time most freely. Um, someone like Tom Lane is a leader in the Postgres community. And to contextualize, Tom Lane is kind of the Linus Torvalds of, uh, of Postgres. And he's a leader in, in the Postgres community not just because he's very, very, very smart, though he is, but because he holds an ongoing potlatch with his technical skills. He willingly answers questions from all the different members of the community, and he swiftly fixes problems that are brought to his attention. He takes on difficult core problems of development. He gives heavily of his time and skill, and in turn, he amasses influence. Another word for influence is social capital. So when I answer your postage questions in the mailing list, I do not receive a cash payment, but assuming you're not a sociopath, I incur a small sense of reciprocal obligation. <coughs> I earn a little bit of social capital. So what good is social capital? Um, here's some things you can buy with social capital. Uh, communities are often skeptical of big new features or changes because they can be <coughs> disruptive. Someone with social capital can get a fair hearing on a big new scary feature. A uh, developer might not be expert in all the areas of the code base, but if she has social capital, she can tap other experts and get a swift answer to her questions. Also, sufficient standing in one community enables direct collaboration 
with a, one, a one project with another. So when Tom Lane makes a comment about post disk, I listen. If he provides a patch, I apply it. He has social capital that is transferable. Now it might seem that Tom Lane is getting a raw deal. Um, in return for hours and hours of highly skilled effort invested in the Postgres community, all he gets back is influence and social capital in the Postgres community. That's a pretty circular benefit. Um, in return for being a gracious expert, he gains privileged access to other gracious experts. It's not something that's necessarily going to put food on the table. However, because he is an influential contributor <coughs> to an important software project, because he's the owner of a huge amount of social capital in the Postgres economy, he's also a highly desirable employee for companies that use or support the software. So over the past 10 years, Tom has worked for Red Hat, he's worked for Salesforce.com, and currently for Crunchy Data. So here the cash economy finally rears its head as the three economies interact. Um, Crunchy Data pays for Postgres people like Tom and myself who work as part of the Postgres community and generate social capital and influence for themselves and apply attention to the Postgres software so the software lives and grows and becomes useful to other organizations. Who may, in turn, pay crunchy data. And then the cycle repeats. The cash economy, that's the economy we worry about the most when we're thinking about open source. And for good reason, open source is great at creating value, it is unbelievably terrible at capturing value. <laughs> A couple of years ago, there was a study by Nadia Iqbal for the Ford Foundation. She investigated the deficit in spending on open source software infrastructure. Um, software frameworks like Django or Rails, libraries like jQuery or OpenSSL, was software infrastructure. Now, infrastructure is the least visible open source software. It's the kind of thing you use without even knowing you're using it. And what she found was dismay. These projects had present, not future value. They were actively used by Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Netflix, even governments, they directly caused tax rapid rise, but they hadn't captured the financial value they deserved. These infrastructural projects were disproportionately maintained by individuals or part-time by small groups. So the software is loved by the marketplace, the maintainers, yeah. Oh, Dan Greenfield, um, I personally get regular demands for unpaid work by healthy, high-profit companies, <coughs> large and small. If I don't respond in a timely fashion, if I'm not willing to accept a crappy pull request, I will be get labeled as a jerk. Just relying on people's goodwill isn't going to work. We'll end up disproportionately appealing to independent developers and developers on a personal level, and that's just not sustainable. Publishing and contributing to open source is going to continue happening regardless of whether I'm getting paid for it or not, but it will be slow and unfocused, which is fine. It's how open source has already always worked, but it doesn't need to be this way. So this is not just a problem for generic infrastructure projects. You know, we in Geospatial are not immune to infrastructure underinvestment. So Martin Davis, the core developer of the JTS Algorithms Library, is used by almost all of our open source geo software, either directly or via the GIS, C++, and JSTS JavaScript libraries. He has a day job that involves precisely zero JTS work. Um, Proj4 reprojection also underlies almost all of our software that's maintained for years by Howard Butler. This consulting company works mostly in point clouds. There's no direct fund to work for it. The Google Image Library, which is also used in almost all our software, is maintained incredibly well by Evan Roll. But as a contract developer, Evan is usually paid to add new features and formats to Google. He provides most of the critical maintenance, stability, and release work on his own time. So the question is, how can it be another way? And the knee jerk reaction is to say, hey, the proprietary model works to force value from the cash economy into the software attention commodity economy. Use that. But unfortunately, the two models cannot be reconciled. The proprietary software depends on the restriction of use. <coughs> While open source is all about removing those restrictions, they're not compatible. If we're going to start trying to keep our open source ecosystem healthy, we need to begin recognizing the value of free things, you know, the value of communal property. <coughs> Back in my hometown um, in Victoria, Canada, there is a petting zoo. The admission is free by donation. I always donate. Um, now, why would I do that, right? <coughs> I get it for free. Um, I donate because I like to see the goats. 
I like to see the baby goats. And I know that if I don't donate, it's entirely possible that sometime the baby goats won't be there anymore. <laughs> this is the morning running of the goats. Um, every summer day at 10 a.m. when the zoo opens. Um, there's really no excuse for not liking baby goats. <laughs> Everybody likes baby goats. Um, I also like open source because it has software. You know, as a consultant, I've designed systems with both open source and proprietary components. And my reasons for preferring open source components uh, be that I value the avoidance of license overhead, both the monetary overhead of buying stuff and the administrative overhead of maintaining license compliance. I value the transparency of the components, um, avoiding expensive black box debugging, custom shims between theoretically off-the-shelf software. I value the flexibility of the components, allowing features to be added without re-architecting the system by pushing the necessary improvements into upstream projects. And I value the access to expertise, often core developers, by the open source community. And except for the last item, you know, my reasons for preferring open source components, they all flow to some extent from the principles of software freedom, the freedom to examine, modify, and distribute the source code. So those are my reasons for preferring open source components. Not necessarily everybody's. Um, in 2017, GitHub ran a randomized survey of what they said was, anyone who uses or otherwise engages with open source technology development, whether passively or actively through contributions. And from the survey, the top two reasons people chose open source software over proprietary were stability and security. Now, the open development process favored by open source communities tends to produce stable and secure software, but neither stability nor security naturally follow from software freedom. Proprietary software is not automatically less stable or less secure. So that's really worrying to me. Uh, the top reasons cited for using open source software have nothing to do with the open source nature of the software. The implication is that um, for peer users, at least in this survey, institutions are no different from individuals. As long as the cost is equivalent, they'll choose the stable, secure product. So currently, that happens to be open source software, uh, quite frequently. But presumably, that could change at any time. So we can't necessarily count on institutional users to keep the baby goats warm and fed. Um, so what about institutional contributors? Why do they know? The, the field of institutional contributors is incredibly diverse. Um, there's a lot of reasons they contribute. And here are some reasons different kinds of institutions have for contribution, arranged in, in order of enlightenment. Um, open source support companies like Red Hat or Crunchy or Hortonworks are obviously very enlightened. Um, you can see they store four windows on the enlightenment scale. And, and this should be no surprise. Uh, their whole value proposition is having the best expertise on the best software. So investment in open source is a no-brainer for them. <coughs> software as a service companies like Salesforce or Mapbox usually are built on open source because it gets into market quickly with flexible components at low cost. And once in the market, the value proposition of a software as a service company is about features, reliability, and performance. An enlightened SaaS company will know it needs direct access to expertise of the components they use, or they risk losing customers to downtime or surprising bugs. Proprietary software companies, like Auto Desk and Esri, sometimes embed some piece of open source software in their larger applications. The embedding saves some development time and effort, and if they're enlightened, they'll maintain a relationship with the open source community in case they need extra features or encounter a bug they can't quickly fix themselves. But honestly, most don't. Uh, software systems integration consultants, IBM, HP, Capgemini, those kinds of companies, they build systems for customers using open source components. They may sell themselves as experts in the open source components, uh, or they might just use it under the covers without telling the customer. Regardless, an enlightened consultant will maintain a relationship with the open source community in case they need extra features, in case they encounter a bug, they can't quickly fix themselves. But again, most don't. Um, great big companies like Facebook or Google or Salesforce, they contribute because they have a large exposure to a particular piece of software, and they recognize the risk and opportunity in that exposure. Now, even non-technology companies can be enlightened. So, enlightened insurance companies are known to keep core open source develop database developers on staff to support their, their, you know, their installations. Um, enlightened high-frequency traders employ Linux kernel developers for performance tweaks. All that said, you know, most organizations show an incredibly low degree of enlightenment. 
many, many, many companies or governments or NGOs use open source. Very few of those organizations recognize their dependence on open source projects and direct their resources accordingly. For projects that are visible, you know, projects and organizations know they're using and depending on, it's possible there will be enough enlightenment that organizations will willingly devote resources to their upkeep. You know, they'll hire their own resources if they're big enough, or if they're smaller, they'll purchase support from a support company. But relatively few of them seem to be that enlightened. Um, back when I was at Boundless, which is a geospatial open source support company, uh, my CEO at the time, Eddie Pickle, used to say to me, my god, all we're doing is selling insurance. How hard is that to understand? And he was a little exasperated because it seemed very, very hard indeed for the customers to understand. Um, right now, the open source cash economy is like an unregulated insurance market. And unregulated insurance markets don't work so well because no one thinks they need insurance until something terrible happens to them. Right? Left to their own devices, the young and the healthy often don't bother to get health insurance. So the unregulated health insurance markets are dominated by the old and sick. Premiums go up, and when catastrophe strikes, the uninsured show up at the emergency room. Open source users also go to the emergency room. You know, the strange voicemail messages, the private emails with urgent on the subject line, Twitter and GitHub harassment. These are all things that open source developers have experienced. And these are all trips to the software emergency room that some users want to get for free. All we're doing is selling insurance. Like, how hard is that to understand? Still, there is a lot of good news in the open source economy. I mean, the attention economy of open source software is good at weeding out weak projects and amassing critical numbers of developers around successful projects. The gift economy of open source communities promotes collaborative instincts that can provide core contributors with the leverage necessary to make a living in the cash economy. And the cash economy sometimes works to funnel, funnel resources into the larger, more visible open source projects. You know, from support companies and software as a service companies, and large institutions are liked enough to recognize that buying insurance for their software assets makes sense. But there's no small amount of bad news, too. Uh, the invisible but necessary infrastructure projects are chronically underfunded. And user facing projects all too frequently suffer from featureitis as funding and effort crowds around the next cool thing rather than making the current thing more stable or faster. Digital, Digital Ocean did a large survey earlier this year. And good news, um, over 70% of developers said their company expected them to routinely use open source software in their work, um, except, uh-oh, you only get to use it, not work on it. Only 34% of companies gave time to give back to open source. And that's just time. You know, and when it came to cold hard cash, 75% gave less than $1,000, which is to say they didn't give anything. So, some of the largest companies, the Googles and the Facebooks and Microsofts, they have put together a small program called the Core Infrastructure Initiative to fund open source infrastructure. But their focus is generic network encoding software. So if we wait for the Core Infrastructure Initiative to help with geospatial open source infrastructure, we could be waiting a long time. And there's, there's great things to be done here. There is the imaginated heaven here. Because open source projects require very few resources, relatively speaking. And institutions control a great many resources. I keep talking about institutions. Um, because the cash resources of institutions dwarf the amount of spare time and unpaid vacations that open source community members can spend on software. Um, so if you're here as an employee of an institution, uh, your institution is probably already enlightened. But just to make sure, here's a checklist, right? Does your institution allow or encourage you or a coworker to spend time improving the projects you use? If not, does your institution have a support contract with an open source support company? Or does your institution have a direct contract with an open source developer? Or does your institution use a software as a service that supports open source? Or does your institution donate to a program like the Core Infrastructure Initiative? And I might have sold heroes short in favor of systems. Because the systems, you know, the interlocking economies of open source, the large groups of developers, the routine use of open sourcing companies, all that, all that starts with decisions and advocacy at the individual level and grows from there. 
So I laid down a lot of responsibility at the feet of employment institutions. You know, boring responsibility for making sure that old software is maintained. But that's not all there is. You know, institutions can be transformed and harnessed to support open source innovation if their employees are willing to grasp the role and take the plunge. So I want, I want to finish my story about the open, about the origins of Postgres. Because there's a character in there I didn't mention, who you've never heard of. Uh, he's not a mythic open source founder. He's not a coder. But without him, there might not be a post um, So back in 2001, after I said, wouldn't it be great, and David said, yes, and I can do that. After a few weeks of work, uh, we had a primitive version of post -its. But it didn't do much um, beyond storage and retrieval. It was lacking most of the computational geometry algorithms we expect in the GIS system. Fortunately, a civil servant in the BC government, the British Columbia government, had a vision for a toolkit to allow the government to build GIS data processing systems without installing big GIS software packages. Um, he secured funding from the federal government by an industrial investment program, and he contracted <coughs> a local company to write the software. The software he contracted for was called the Java Topology Suite, <coughs> JTS. And the contract he wrote specified that it was to be delivered under an open source license. And because it was open source, we were able to port that software to C++ and then use it for what became post to 0 0.8, the first version that could do real zero processing. <coughs> that same civil servant also contracted with us to maintain the provincial road centerline network and encouraged us to use Postgres as the database for that project. That was the first production deployment of Postgres. He also encouraged us to use hours from the contract to approve Postgres, to handle the roads data faster and more accurately. When we bid on contracts to manage and improve hydrography data in the province, he didn't worry that our solutions were based on Postgres and open source Java instead of Oracle or Esri. He just made sure that we could produce the results that he wanted. The improvements that Dave made to Postgres during those contracts led directly to Postgres 1.0. So you've never heard of this guy. His name is Mark Sondheim, but you probably used to use spatial software that works because of decisions he made over 15 years ago as an employee of a big boring government institution. All these projects, QGIS, PostGIS, Fiona, Google, GeoServer, GeoTools, Turf, GeoJangle, they all <coughs> use GEOS or JTS. The most important people in open source ecosystem are not the mythic hackers. They're the heroes who have access to resources. And there are people like many of you who can direct resources or who advise those who can't. There are folks with problems to solve, <coughs> And they make decisions about how to apply resources to those problems. These everyday decisions in big, boring institutions are what lay the foundations for others. Who's going to make their own decisions? Now, if these people are going to be open, if they value software freedom, they can work together. If they work together, they can eventually get more value out than they put in. That's open source economy in action. So, so why do we code? And more precisely, why do we code open source? Because there are multiple economies in which it makes make sense. Software retention economy, gathering development effort around the winning software, winnowing out the losers and the also-rans, the developer gift economy, rewarding altruism and community-mindedness with social capital and influence, and the cash economy, where the value derived from open source is worth billions. And even the relatively tiny amount that flows back is circulating and continuing to provide developer effort for the software. We code open source because it makes sense ethically and financially. We code open source because we like the big goats. <laughs> we code open source because it's the right thing to do. Thank you very much.